Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing heart failure and heart failure medications. Okay, so we are in the process of discussing uh, hypertension-induced heart failure, okay? And we're currently in the process of discussing the new neurohormonal responses to mean arterial pressure going down, okay? So we've discussed that one of the key things that happens in hypertension-induced uh, cardiac heart failure initially is that uh, mean arterial pressure is going to be reduced because the stroke volume is going to go down. Uh, but uh, what's going to happen is you're going to get neurohormonal uh, responses to that, and that's what we're looking at at the moment. So we've seen that the sympathetic nervous system is going to be activated by the fall in mean arterial pressure, okay? And that the sympathetic nervous system is going to act on the heart, firstly, to increase heart rate and also inotropy of the heart, okay? And that's going to help to bring back up cardiac output, and bringing back up cardiac output is going to help to raise back the mean arterial pressure. Okay. Uh, in addition, it's going to act on uh, the arterioles which supply the gastrointestinal tract. It's going to cause those smooth muscle cells to contract, which is going to constrict those arterioles and reduce blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract. That, firstly, is going to shunt the cardiac output to more important tissues such as the brain and the heart. Okay, and since the cardiac output is compromised, that's an important thing. Okay, in addition, it's going to raise total peripheral resistance. It's going to make it more difficult for blood to return from the arterial system to the venous system, and that's going to help to maintain mean arterial pressure. Okay, right. So, now what we want to discuss is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Okay, so, what's going to happen is the sympathetic nervous system is also going to activate certain cells of the kidney. Okay, now we're not going to go into the details of which specific cells it is in the kidneys that are going to be activated. Okay, all we're going to say is that certain special cells in the kidneys are going to be activated by the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system is going to activate certain cells in the kidney. Specifically, it's going to work through beta-1 receptors on those special cells in the kidney. And the response of those cells in the kidney will be to release a hormone known as renin into the blood. Okay, so renin is going to go into the blood. Now, what does renin do once it's within the blood? And I'll draw a blood vessel here. So it's going into the blood. Well, it's going to break down something else that's in the blood. Okay, so uh, something which is in the blood because the liver secretes it into the blood is called angiotensinogen. Okay, so angiotensinogen is a normal constituent of the blood. It's secreted by the liver, okay, so it's always there. Now, when renin goes into the blood from the kidneys, which have been stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system, it's going to break down angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Okay, so the renin is actually an enzyme which is going to break down angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Okay, so let's add a bit of colour onto this. So we had renin dumped into the blood by the kidneys. Okay, now it's catalyzing this breakdown of angiotensinogen, the precursor secreted by the liver, into this new molecule, angiotensin 1. Okay, angiotensin 1 is then going to be further converted to angiotensin 2. Okay, now what catalyzes the conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2? Well, it's an enzyme known as angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE for short. So the A is for angiotensin. Okay, the C is for converting, and then the E is for enzyme. Okay, and for short, that's referred to as ACE. Now, the angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, is actually found on the uh, luminal side of endothelial cells. Okay, so it's attached to the luminal membrane of uh, endothelial cells. So all blood vessels have angiotensin converting enzyme uh, within their lumens, basically. It's not free within the blood plasma, it's attached to the endothelial cells. But it's specifically concentrated in the pulmonary capillaries. So the capillaries of the lung have a very high concentration of angiotensin converting enzyme, but it is actually found all over the body uh, on endothelial cells.
Okay, so as soon as you get angiotensin 1 within the blood, it's going to be converted by the angiotensin converting enzyme that's um, all over the place uh, within the um, membranes of the endothelial cells. It's going to be converted into angiotensin 2. Okay, so what then does angiotensin 2 do? Okay, well, angiotensin 2 is going to firstly cause large arteries to contract. Okay, so angiotensin 2 is capable of causing the smooth muscle cells in large arteries, such as the aorta, to contract. Okay, so it causes arterial constriction. Okay, that was different. That's very different to what the sympathetic nervous system directly causes. The sympathetic nervous system causes arterioles to contract that lead to specific portions of the body. And geotensin 2 is capable of causing smooth muscle cells of very large arteries to start contracting and therefore constricting large, large arteries. Okay, and it does this again for a G-protein coupled receptor. Okay. And I'll draw this G-protein coupled receptor here. So again, it's got seven membrane spanning alpha helices, an amino terminus extracellularly, and a carboxylic acid terminus intracellularly. And the name of this receptor is AT1. Now, what does that stand for? Well, the A stands for angiotensin. Okay. The T stands for 2, and that's important. You are tempted often to think of the AT is standing for angio and then tensin, but it doesn't. The A stands for angiotensin, the T stands for 2, and then this is angiotensin 2 receptor 1. So it's the type 1 angiotensin 2 receptor, basically. Okay, so this is a receptor for angiotensin 2, basically. And you have this on the smooth muscle cells uh, of the large arteries. Okay, and again, it is GQ coupled, just like the alpha-1 receptors. So this is going to activate GQ, and that's how it's going to cause contraction of the smooth muscle cells of those large arteries, and hence constriction of those large arteries. Okay, right. So what's that going to do? Constricting the huge great arteries? Well, the arteries are full of blood. If you constrict them, you're going to have that same volume of blood in a smaller spatial volume, or at least it will be tinily uh, reduced. And then that will increase the pressure of the artery, uh, arterial blood. Okay, so constricting the arteries is then going to raise mean arterial pressure. So this is also going to help bring mean arterial pressure up. Okay, angiotensin 2 also has important effects on the kidney. Oh, sorry, indirectly though, uh, not directly on the kidney. It's going to firstly cause the release of aldosterone from the adrenal gland, which is then going to have important effects on the kidney. Okay, so angiotensin 2 is also going to uh, activate a certain layer of the adrenal gland. So we're back to the adrenal gland here. So I'll redraw out the adrenal gland. Here's the medulla here. And now we're not interested in the medulla this time. We're interested in the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex, which I will colour in in red here. So uh, there are three main layers of the adrenal cortex. We are interested in the outermost layer of those three. Okay, and the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex is known as the zona glomerulosa. Okay, so what's going to happen is angiotensin 2 is going to stimulate angiotensin 2 receptor 1s on the cells of the zona glomerulosa, which is this outermost layer of the adrenal cortex. So as I say, there are three separate layers of the adrenal cortex. The zona glomerulosa is the outermost layer. Then the second layer underneath the zona glomerulosa is the zona fasciculata. Okay, fasciculata. Let me just bring this up a bit. Fasciculata. And then underneath the zona fasciculata, you have the zona reticularis. Okay, so those are the three different layers of the adrenal cortex. Okay, so it is the zona glomerulosa which responds to angiotensin 2 because it has the angiotensin 2 subtype 1 receptor on its surface. Okay, so angiotensin 2 is going to activate the cells of this outermost uh, adrenal cortical layer 
And what do these cells do once they've been activated? Well, they release another hormone into the blood, a steroid hormone called aldosterone. Okay, so the zona glomerulosa cells release aldosterone into the blood, and aldosterone is now going to have an effect on the kidney. Okay, and it's going to reduce uh, your urine production. It's going to uh, retain salt, basically. It's going to retain sodium chloride and stop you excreting it in your urine. And by maintaining sodium chloride, it's then going to increase um, the uh, amount of water reabsorbed in the kidney, okay? And therefore, it's going to reduce the amount you urinate. So basically, it's going to retain salt and therefore water so it's going to retain blood volume or body fluid volume but in particular we're interested in blood volume okay so the whole point here is that what this is going to do is it's going to increase blood volume because now uh, you're going to be decreasing your urine output by the kidneys okay so you're going to reduce the amount of fluid you excrete in the kidneys okay and that's going to mean uh, that um, the blood volume is going to accumulate over time because usually blood volume or rather body fluid volumes is in equilibrium. You're taking in a certain amount of liquid uh, through drinking and then you're excreting the same amount through uh, urination. Okay, and that's how you maintain an equilibrium. If uh, we are now reducing the amount that we actually excrete through urination and we aren't changing the amount we're drinking, okay, then we're going to accumulate uh, volume and that's going to affect blood volume. Okay, so what's this going to do? Well, where is this increased blood actually going to end up? Well, generally it's going to end up in the venous reservoirs, particularly the central venous reservoir. Okay, which means that central venous pressure is going to go up because you've now got more blood. Okay, and um, when central venous pressure goes up, we know what this will do. It will increase the right ventricular end diastolic volume, and then once you've increased the right ventricular end diastolic volume, that will help to increase right ventricular stroke volume. Okay, and um, that's going to uh, mean that you're going to increase the stroke volume. Okay, so by increasing blood fluid levels, you're going to hopefully increase uh, cardiac output and therefore increase blood pressure that way. Okay, right, so that's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, okay, which is going to be activated by uh, the sympathetic nervous system. So its two effects are uh, to constrict the large arteries and thereby raise mean arterial pressure and also uh, to increase water retention and salt retention and therefore increase body fluid volumes in particular blood volume which is then going to um, increase mainly the venous reservoirs particularly the central venous reservoir but also the pulmonary venous reservoir and both of those things are going to uh, increase cardiac output and thereby increase mean arterial pressure okay right uh, so uh, the final thing that i just want to add on to this is that you're also uh, going to activate the release of antidiuretic hormone by the posterior pituitary. Okay, so if I just draw the pituitary gland out here, okay, when blood pressure goes down, okay, and that's detected by the carotid sinus, we've seen how it's going to activate the sympathetic nervous system, which will do all of the things that we've just seen. But in addition, blood pressure going down uh, and being recorded as going down by the carotid sinus is also going to activate the posterior pituitary gland here. Okay, shown here. So the pituitary gland consists of these two portions, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. We're interested in the posterior pituitary here. The posterior pituitary is going to be activated to release antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Okay, so this is antidiuretic hormone. And antidiuretic hormone is also going to act on the kidneys to increase uh, the amount of water that you retain and decrease the amount that you excrete. Okay, and this is also going to help to bring up blood volume just like aldosterone. So aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone together are going to be acting to increase blood volume so that you can increase the central venous reservoir, the pulmonary venous reservoir, and thereby increase cardiac output um, using the Frank-Starling law and thereby increase mean arterial pressure. 
Okay, right. So now we have summarized all of the neurohormonal mechanisms. Let's now summarize it more concisely, okay? So let's summarize what all of these have done and what the effects of uh, all of these neurohormonal mechanisms is. So I'll just get another piece of paper. Okay, right. So the key thing to understand is that what all these neurohormonal mechanisms were trying to do was bring back up mean arterial pressure. Okay, so at the end of all of this, mean arterial pressure is probably going to be back up where we started, i.e. hypertensive. So mean arterial pressure is back up, and you're now at that hypertensive level. Okay, right. You have brought up cardiac output, okay? Um, and you've brought up cardiac output by this chronic sympathetic stimulation, okay? So cardiac output is back up. It's not quite at the level that it once was, but it is certainly doing okay. The problem is that you've got this chronic sympathetic stimulation, okay? And that's causing a chronic tachycardia, so the heart rate is far too high, basically, okay? So you've got tachycardia. Okay, and also you've got the chronic sympathetic stimulation, and I can't stress enough how important that is going to be. Okay, so heart rate is too high, that's one of the things that we've produced there. Okay, and in addition, we've also got central venous pressure uh, now higher than it ever was, along with uh, pulmonary venous pressure as well. Okay, so by uh, increasing blood volume, we've increased the size of the venous reservoirs, so they are now too high. Okay, so this is where we are standing at the moment. We have an okay cardiac output. The problem is that to maintain that, we have to have this chronic sympathetic nervous system stimulation, and that's causing a tachycardia, okay? Uh, in addition, our blood pressure is back at the hypertensive level because of the neurohormonal mechanisms, and our central venous pressure is too high, and our pulmonary venous pressure is too high, again, because of the neurohormonal mechanisms which have retained uh, bodily fluids and therefore brought blood volume up. Okay, right. We will uh, continue this discussion in the next video where we will see how this is a recipe for disaster, okay? How it's going to cause hypertrophy of the cardiomyocytes uh, when you have this occurring chronically, okay? And how that is going to gradually weaken the heart more and more and more and drive you into heart failure.